Thank everybody. We are so excited. You are here. As I said in the earlier service, like the little chilliness outside is like giving my bones joy. So I hope you also have joy this morning. Go ahead and stand with us as we center our hearts and our minds. No matter what, you know, we might be carrying that heaviness or something, maybe the holiday. I don't know. Um, but he deserves our full attention this morning, both in our worship through music and our worship through listening to the word being poured out on us. So let's just take a second and ask him to meet us here this morning. Lord, captivate our hearts as we kneel before you, both spiritually and maybe even physically. And God, may you get the honor and the glory that is due your name that we've been trying to take. And Lord, we just pour that out to you this morning. Keep the distractions away. And Lord, let us give you our full attention. Amen. Make it easy. You make it easy to love me. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. Oh, you make it easy to trust me. You have never. been faithful every time. All I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, Jesus, you came to my rescue. You took my place upon that cross. You redeem what I have lost. Now my whole world revolving around you. You're the center of my life. You're the treasure. You're the prize. Oh, all I want is you. Jesus. That's a hard thing to declare. That's a hard thing to mean. But I pray that as we sing it this morning, that it would be your prayer. That God, wherever you lead me, God, where, whatever it costs me, God, all we want is you. We want to honor you with our life. So join with us as we sing that.
to say or do And you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus Our strength in your mighty name Our peace in the darkest days In the darkest day remains Jesus. This we know. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. We will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. face to him.
be so, Lord. May it be so. You guys can take a seat.
Go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to be in verse 17, and then we're going to also be covering um, chapter 14 this morning. So we've got a fair bit to cover um, this morning. Hopefully we can do this in a way that's faithful, but also uh, won't give you some listener fatigue. All right. Let me begin by reading in verse 17 of chapter 13. Follow along with me. Hopefully you'll have uh, a copy of this translation, or if not your translation, follow along on your iPad, your phone. Let's read the word of God together. All right. Beginning in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines. Even, even though it was nearby, for God said, the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around towards the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear on a solemn oath saying, God will certainly come to your aid, then you must, make, you must take my bones with you from this place. Verse 20, they set out from Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night. So, so that they could travel by day or night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Pi-hiroth between Migdal and the sea. You must camp in front of Baal-Zephron facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. A few more verses. Follow along. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled... Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about the people and said, what have we done? We have released Israel from serving us. So he got his chariot ready, took his troops with him. He took 600 of his best chariots and all the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in each one. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, And he pursued the Israelites who were going out defiantly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his horsemen and his army, chased after them and caught up with them as they camped by the sea beside Pi-Hiroth and in front of Baal-Zephron. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for you and we're thankful for the privilege once again to be able to hear your word. And so, God, I pray that through the means of your word and the work of your spirit that you would help, you would convict, you would challenge, you would even transform us this morning. Help me, God, as I convey your word so that it would be clear, so that it would be helpful and useful for all of us. We love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So right when you think it's over, it's not, right? Once again, Pharaoh is determined not to let this go. And this meaning Israel. He's, he has once again dug his heels in the ground and said, I'm not, I am not letting Israel go. This time, however, it would be for the very last time. One would think, right, that the devastating judgment upon Egypt would give Pharaoh some sense, but to no avail, Right? Pharaoh would still stubbornly chase after Israel. So what happens? The dramatic conclusion has been set in motion, right? Pharaoh will be brought to the end of not only himself, but along with those who would choose to follow him. And then we would see the glory of God on display for not only Pharaoh 
to see along with his chariots and horsemen and all of his officers and officials, but the people of God would bear witness to the glory of God in these moments. Furthermore, and as the people would witness the glory of God, his people would fear him and believe in him. You see, everything that God is going to be doing here is for a purpose. God is not just flexing his divine muscles or he's not executing his judgment and his justice just so that he can do so for some selfish reasons, but rather he is doing so for the express purpose of drawing people to him so that they would believe in him and fear him. That's the ultimate purpose of why God is doing what he's doing. If you don't believe me, wait till the end of chapter 14. Don't look yet, and we will see how I believe that that's in fact the point of all of this. Which leads me to, well, Paul, what's the, uh, the main idea that we're going to be covering this morning? It would be the following. God will reveal his glory so people will revere him and believe in him. Anytime that God desires to say, I want to show you who I am, it's for those very purposes, all right? And so how do we see God's glory revealed in this text? There's three ways. First of all, we're going to see God fulfill his promise. Secondly, God provides his presence. And lastly, he shows his power, all right? This is how you're going to see the glory of God revealed before all of our eyes, before the eyes then of Israel and even Pharaoh and we're going to get a chance to see how God draws his people in in such an incredible way. Don't believe me? Let me show you how I believe that's in fact true from the text. But let's begin with this very first point with how God fulfills his promise. So as God started leading his people away from Egypt, he chose a significant way to guide them. But we'll discuss that here in a few moments because God in his goodness knew what Israel would be prepared for versus what they would not be prepared for. And so in his goodness, he guides them away from certain lands so that they would not collapse in fear and run back to Egypt, right? So God is good to lead them a certain way. We'll talk more about that here in a second. In the midst of this text, there are two verses that if we're not careful, we will literally race right over them in the midst of what so many folks love to be able to look at and to see, and that's the parting of the Red Sea, right? This incredible moment where God rescues his people, they walk on dry ground, and that's the highlight of the moments, which is good and true, and we will look at that. But before we get to that, there is something here that we need to make sure not to overlook because it speaks of God's promise to fulfill what he said he would do. There's two ways that we see this. According to the text, Moses took someone with him while someone said something to the people of God. Okay? First, let's look at how Moses took someone. Surprisingly, right, and they managed to do this, how we're not told all that we're told from Scripture is that it happened. Okay? So sometimes, I've said this before, we, we love to find out the details of things that we would like to know that's in the Bible, but... God doesn't give us all the things we want to hear about in the Bible. He gives us what we need to know from the Bible, right? So that his point is made clear. So I don't know how they managed to collect the remains of Joseph, but they had the mummified body of Joseph there with him, right? To take him out of the land of Egypt. Now, why is this important? Why am I bringing up the mummified version of Joseph, right? Well, for one... Joseph represents how God rescued his people, right? The book of Genesis ends with Joseph declaring to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for what? Good, right? And so it, it encapsulates everything that God was up to and was doing in the life of Joseph in order for God to rescue and to save his people. So think about this. Joseph, not from Egypt, goes to Egypt in order to rescue his people. And then, in what is a dramatic moment, Joseph finally gets a chance to see his father, whom his father thought he was dead, right? And there's this beautiful moment where they cry, they get a chance to see each other, and Joseph's dad, Jacob, right, gets a chance to see even his grandchildren from Joseph. It's, it's beautiful, right? 
beyond that, what we also read in Genesis is how Joseph, after those moments of just getting a chance to see his father again, would come to a point where clearly he would have to say goodbye to his father. The Pharaoh at the time gave Joseph everything he needed to go and bury his father in a plot and in a land that he bought and that he wanted to be buried at in Canaan. Okay? So think about this for just a moment, right? Joseph's desire was to be buried back in his homeland exactly where his father was buried nearly 500 years later. How do we know that? If you go to Joshua chapter 24, verse 32, it speaks to this exactly, right? We don't have time to get there, but follow me here. Joseph, like I said, came to Egypt from the land of Canaan, was not born there, was not from there, but now he's going back out of Egypt because someone who was born in Egypt is now leading the people out of it, and that's Moses, right? So it's beautiful. You see this amazing exchange, but what is all of this about? Like, is this Joseph's weird, selfish request to take his bones with Israel for, for him to be able to be buried back with his dad? No, 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 no. He asked because of what he knew, and he wanted to be a part of what this great exodus would be. Moses took, but then Joseph said something, and he said, God will certainly come to your aid then you must take my bones with you from this place. Why do I bring this up? Because Joseph was a man who knew that God was trustworthy. He knew that God would rescue them. He says he will certainly come to your aid. And y'all, he said that over 400 years prior. The author of Hebrews, whom we don't exactly know, even gave commentary to this, expressing how Joseph had a characteristic about himself that all of us should look at and say, man, something has to be said about this individual. Hebrews 11.22 says, by faith, believing, he believed as he was nearing the end of his life, he mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. He believed, right? Y'all, when I read what Joseph represents, I, I ask myself, how often am I confronted with the faithfulness of God and struggle to believe that he is in control, right? That God is involved with his people. He's not distant. He's not away. He's there. That he's working even when I cannot see him working. How often? do I struggle with the pace with which God has determined for my life, for my work, for my family, right? Joseph has been embalmed for over 400 years. 400 years. Y'all, I, I can't be patient sometimes for a week and, and what we have unfolding here before our eyes is something that an individual was told by God, a promise made to Abraham that he, he will create a nation out of Abraham. And then here he is going to be with his forefathers, right? At, as the last breath he takes, he says, I will remember that God is trustworthy. And so know, my brothers, that he will be faithful to rescue what faith of this individual. And none of this will come to pass until 400 years later. It's moments like these that when I'm waiting, my heart begins to unveil things that sometimes I don't like, but it's necessary for them to be able to come out so that God, God can begin to do a work within my life. It's in these moments where I I doubt God and I wonder, and it's not to say that you can't doubt or you can't question things or have questions for God. Those things are, are good and fine and okay, but they do in fact reveal something, don't they? It's in these moments that I express my concern with God about the pace and the path that he's determined, and I may not like it. And it's in these moments that I have to remind myself that God knows more than I do and has a better plan than I can ever come up with. 
which means that I need to either relinquish my control or stop questioning the character of God. Do we believe that he is faithful? Or do we sometimes, because we question his character, begin to hold on and take control? Joseph knew that God would, in fact, be faithful. Y'all ever been there? (laughs) Feel overlooked by God, neglected by God, and then we begin to think to ourselves that God isn't good, that he doesn't care. And y'all, we've had almost a full year in this calendar. And that's not to say that whatever circumstances may have come up have not been difficult or hard. Because maybe, just maybe, you're like, this is not how I had it planned. This is not what I I thought was going to happen. This is not the pace in which I wanted for my life. And yet, what are we reminded of in this text? I think there's a pattern here to see about God, and there's a hope that we can hold on to. What's the pattern? Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, I think, speaks to this. And you guys know this if you're a student of God's word. It says, for, I, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, if Joseph would have written this, I don't think he would have said, hey, I know what's coming, let's wait 400 years. He would have said, let's get out of here tomorrow. <laughs> Right? But no, that's not how God had it written. The hope that we can hold on to is the fact that God can be trusted even when he is working in the background and we cannot see him. Right? That then gives us joy to endure whatever comes. When you, when you can't trust that he's in control, when you cannot know that he can be the hope that we hold on to, it is very hard. And I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy, Christ-centered, resurrected kind of joy that we're supposed to have as believers. You can't have that unless you know for a fact that God can be trusted and that he has a perfect plan. It's hard to. But what we find in this text, y'all, is that God is faithful to his promise, right? Secondly, not only is that good for them to know, but God also provides his presence, right? So not only is his promise being fulfilled, but his presence is being shown here to the people of God. Notice what happens in verse 20. It says, they set out from Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and a pillar of fire to give them light at night. Why? So that they could travel day or night, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, listen to this, never left its place in front of the people. Now, with Joseph on the U-Haul, right, or in tow, it's a joke. Thanks. I try, but it just never... The nation of Israel sets out, right? And we find them settling for camp at Etham. Along the way, they would learn that God, God went ahead of them, right? And he would be among them. Two key things that we, we cannot overlook because this continues to reinforce that there are moments not only in their lives where they would learn that God would always go ahead of them, Right? And we saw that at the beginning of the text because he said, you know what, this route over here where there would be a conflict and there would be war, I am moving them away from that so that they can come where they need to go. Right? And y'all, he, there are moments and times, how often I remember this from Pastor Robbie from before, that in our hindsight, we get a chance to see God's foresight. Right? Where there are moments and times where we, we didn't know, but when we look back, we're like, you know what? God has been there all along going ahead of me. This is God going ahead of them. Right? God would show his people that he goes ahead of them and be among them in two ways. One, through a pillar of cloud by day and through a pillar of fire by night. Right? The people of God, think about this for just a moment because 
you're wondering, wh- what on earth is this? Let me explain this for just a second. This pillar, right? Y'all think in terms of a cloud, right? This is the best way I think I can ex- express it or explain it. If you've ever seen a tornado, you get an idea of what a pillar looks like, right? And it's a cloud. Obviously, there's a lot more going on than that. I'm not saying it's a tornado, but you get the idea, okay? When you think of fire, think the same thing, okay? Now, think of this for a moment as well. The people of God had already witnessed him do incredible things through the plagues in Egypt, right? And what we read about here in verses 20 through 21 is nothing short of the miraculous from God. Some have argued that there must have been some sort of irregular storm that took place at that moment or that because of the sheer size of Israel, as they traveled, they kicked up so much dust that it created a pillar that looked like a cloud. Now the issue with this idea, as one commentator pointed out, is that the pillar of cloud and the fire remained with Israel for 40 years. So this wasn't some freak accident or some happenstance. Forty years of God's presence is with the people of God, right? I'd prefer the explanation that C.S. Lewis says. Each miracle writes for us in small letters something that God has already written or will write in letters almost too large to be noticed across the whole canvas of nature. Now, that's a really eloquent eloquent way of C.S. Lewis saying the following. Who created fire? God did. Who created the cloud? God did. So when we see fire or when we see clouds, they are the small letters that point to an even greater creator who created and commanded these elements. Listen, if God can create the universe, clearly he can create and do something miraculous with a pillar of fire and cloud. This is not a big stretch for God. And again, it comes off of the heels of the plagues, right? It's all stacked together. If we can believe that God is capable of doing those things, clearly we can believe that he can do this. Now, that's not the point of the, of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The point is God is present and God guides. guides. A, a pastor said it this way, God Guides and God goes. He doesn't just stay in the background and say, hey, you got the U-Haul packed up. Glad you got, got, you got that done. Make sure it's strapped in the right way. I'll see you in 15 hours. That's not what God does. God guides and God goes. Now think of this for just a moment. Isn't that what the, what the heart longs for? To know that God guides and God goes with his people. What we like be honest, right, is God's will written like a pillar of cloud in the sky, right? Where to work, where to go, who to marry, where to go to school to, where to move, but that's not how God works, right? The reality is God has given to us everything that we need to live this life, and he's given it to us in two ways through his word, and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is never contrary to, but is consistent with everything that the word of God says, right? That's the reassurance that we have that when God tells us, as you live this life, you have my word, which is truth, and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you that convicts you, that leads you, that guides you, that helps you. Think about it. What does Psalm 119, 105 say? Which is one one of perhaps your favorite verses, a a verse that you memorized growing up. It's a verse that I know. You may not know it by its reference, but you know it when when you hear it, right? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my what? Path, right? We know those things. God has given us his reveal word to understand how to live this life and his spirit to guide us and move us towards his word, right? So think of it. We desire guidance for what we do. Now, you may be in a place where, Paul, I know what passions God has given me. I'm exactly where he wants me to be. I, I know that he's brought this spouse to my life, and I know that it's God's will for me. These things are unquestioned in my life, right? And so 
the, the, what you want, what you desire, in the same way that these people want here, right, is you want to know how you're doing, what you're doing is followed by God's guidance. That you're parenting the way that God would want you to parent. That you're living as a husband and a spouse the way God wants you to live. That you navigate friendships in such a way that you're living it with the guidance of God. That whatever may come in terms of how you navigate work life, how you navigate friendships, how you navigate how you talk to other people, all of that can be found within the word of God. And your heart's desire is to God, I want guidance for those things. And I'll tell you, one of the most practical ways you can find that is go to the book of Proverbs. And you will find great guidance for how you can live this life, right? Like those are the things that we want. Now that's completely contrary to the modern narrative of today. Where the modern narrative is, listen, you, if you're confused and you need guidance, you, you find that guidance in yourself, right? You, you, you find knowledge within you, you do what you need to do. You discover it your way. Don't let anybody tell you how it could be different. You attempt to find those kinds of things within yourself. Self-discovery in you. That is completely contrary to what the Bible teaches that we need to understand meaning and purpose and guidance in life from something outside of us, not something from within us. How do we know that? Because the Bible explicitly says that the heart is desperately wicked. I don't know about you, but in my BC days, before Christ, I followed my heart, and it was not good. I did not end up in very good places. I did not do things that added to my soul, but rather sucked the life out of it, right? It, it just didn't do it. And so I know now on this side of my salvation how much I need the word of God to guide me, right? Think of it, y'all. What else in this world can give you the wisdom that you seek and the assurance that you need other than the timeless truth of God's word? You won't find it. You need his word. What's more is how else are you going to be able to make sense of life outside of knowing that you have the presence of God with you and the guidance of his word together to be able to navigate this life and understand that you can't find it, right? What you find here is something beautiful. God provides his presence, and with his presence, comes his word, his truth, and his desire to lead you, right? This leads, and all of this is stacked on purpose, this leads to this third and very important point, which is God shows his power. Now, we're not going to be able to stop in every nook and cranny here in chapter 14, but I want us to take a look at what happens here, and there's two things that I want us to take note of, of how he shows his power. One, he shows it from what he knows, and secondly, he shows it by what he does. Okay? Let me show you how he shows his power from what he knows. Verse 10. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, now if you have this same translation or maybe it, it, it's similar in the translation you have, I want you to circle certain words because they're important. Okay? The first one is look. All right? The word look, see, saw, they're all over the place here at the last portion of chapter 14, and they are important because God wants to draw their attention not only to what they're seeing, but then also to him, okay? As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, it is because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to bring us out of Egypt? Isn't this what, you, what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone. Why? So that we may serve the Egyptians. It could have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. <laughs> I mean, y'all, if you think about the journey, if you're going with us, this is the complete antithesis of what they actually cried out for. They cried out for God to rescue them. And then what's happened? Something changed. The plan didn't go like what they thought it was going to go. And what happens? They are terrified. In other words, they grew so anxious that they, they collapsed. How did they collapse? Everything in them, even though it's contrary to logic, is telling them we need to go back. 
Back to who? Back to the man who was cruel to us. Back to the one who had us enslaved. Back to the one who ruled over us as a tyrant. That's, that's what they want to go back to. It, isn't it interesting how deep-seated anxiety will cause you sometimes to regress to what isn't logical? Doesn't it? And, and cause you to question whether or not God's plan, God's purposes, God's truth is right. They're getting their first curveball at them, and they don't like what's going on because they see Pharaoh. But yet God knows what's taking place. God understands everything that he's doing. How do we know that? Look at verse 13. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Notice the other word. Circle it. See the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Right? Now think about this for just a moment, right? This would be absolute lunacy to hear from a man to say, stand there and don't move. I know that there's hundreds of chariots that are coming your way, but do me a favor, stand firm. Like, that's just lunacy. You don't, you don't do that, right? You don't stand in the middle of the road when a car's coming. You leave, <laughs> right? Like, that's normal for, for you to be able to, why? Because it would be perfectly normal for you to say, I care about my life, right? And so what do they do? They cry out, but so quickly, they, they completely turn. This would be lunacy if it were not for what God knows. God knows that he sees what he sees, and that day they will never see those Egyptians again. In other words, God understands everything that he is doing, and Moses quickly knew to remind the people he will fight for you. He will fight for you. Notice what it says in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? I've heard it. You need to do something else. Tell the Israelites to break camp as you as for you, lift up your staff, stretch it out, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I am going to harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army and his chariots and horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And you may be wondering, what on earth does it mean for God to receive glory at this moment? What is that? I love what John Piper says about the glory of God and how he defines it. He says, the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's numerous perfections. In other words, this moment here is not an accident, but rather it is going according to God's perfect plans. And what's happening here? Israel would see God's glory through judgment. In other words, God is bringing to justice what he said he would do to Pharaoh. And so what's happening? Salvation is coming through judgment. They are receiving Pharaoh and his armies what they deserve because of them defiantly saying no to God. Now, mind you, y'all, if it were not, and this is so strikingly similar for all of us today on this side of the cross, if it were not for Jesus dying a death that you and I rightfully deserve, we, we deserve the same judgment that Pharaoh and his officials are receiving at that very moment. We, y'all, think of this, are saved because judgment fell on Jesus. That's how we are saved. Now, this is an absolutely beautiful picture of what, what is happening here. And so let me show you another area of what he does to display his glory. It's not just God's glory in judgment, but it's God's glory over creation. That God commands nature itself to do its bidding. Verse 19, then the angel of the Lord who was going in front of the Israelite forces moved and went behind them 
The pillar of cloud moved in front of them and stood behind them. It came between the Egyptians and the Israelites' forces. There was a cloud and darkness. It lit up the night, and neither group came near the other all night long. What's God doing there? He's enveloping his people, and he's protecting them. This is amazing, right? Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. Again, God's glory and command over creation. So the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians set out in pursuit all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen, and went into the sea after them. During the morning watch, the Lord looked, you can circle that again, down at the Egyptian forces from the pillar of fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian forces into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve and made them drive with difficulty. And then there's a moment of clarity. But yet, they're still set in their ways. Let's get away from Israel, the Egyptians said, because the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Duh. Like at this point, it's just like, have you not followed the pattern here, guys? Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 26, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea returned to its normal depth while the Egyptians were trying to escape it. No, it would not happen. The Lord threw them into the sea. The water came back and covered the chariots and horsemen plus the entire army of Pharaoh that had gone after them into the sea. Not even one of them survived. God's glory in judgment, God's glory in creation. Why does he do this? The whole point is found in verses 29 through 31. Listen. But the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians and Israel, circle it, saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel, circle it, saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, guess what happened? The people feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant, Moses. Belief. This kind of fear is not the terrified one that we saw earlier where they're collapsing. This is the kind of fear that is reverential fear for what God has done. In other words, the people of God came to a place where they recognized only God could have done everything that he did amidst all of our doubts amidst all of our concerns, amidst us collapsing. It wasn't our wit or strength that got us through this Red Sea. It was God that got us through all of this. And y'all, God will do the very same thing in our lives, proving himself through his faithfulness in this text to show us I can be trusted. You can lean upon me because I am showing you my control not only over everything that's transpiring in this moment, but I am showing you my control in redemptive history to bring my people out because I said I would. Y'all, if he can save a nation, clearly he can be able to work in your life. This task is not too hard for him. He can clearly guide you. He can clearly be with you. He can clearly provide for you. He can clearly work within your life. All the while, listen to me, sanctifying you. Because that's exactly what was taking place with them. They went from that kind of fear of collapsing at questioning the character and the faithfulness of God to now being in a place of fearful worship before God. Why? Because he's true to his word. That's what they're at. So listen, I don't know where you may be at today. I don't know what may be going on through your mind and your heart, but maybe, just maybe, you 
have been in the same place where I'm at where I, I question both the path and the pace on which God is leading me. And I wonder, is he in control? Is he good? Is he there? When y'all, maybe just maybe what you need to do today or when you get home is to, is to look to this precious portion of scripture and remind yourself of his goodness and his faithfulness in your life. It's as simple as that to, to say, I need to lean upon him and trust him. Why? Because he is trustworthy, right? And, or maybe just maybe it's this week where over and over and over again, you may need to revisit this text and you may need to look at what is happening here and to be reminded that his glory is what draws you to him to take you on bended knee to say, I need to be recaptured by the glory of God in his vast control, not only over all these circumstances, but over nature, over everything, and remind yourself this week, if he can govern this world, he can govern your life. And this week, constantly remind yourself of what he's doing in your life, right? Constantly go back to his word to find where your soul needs to be anchored in. And the reason I tell you guys all of this is because I'm wholeheartedly convinced that God will reveal his glory through his word. Why? So that people will believe in him and fear him. And that's the whole point that God was making here. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for you and incredibly thankful for your word, God. Incredibly thankful for these moments where you show us with such great clarity how much you are in fact in control. So God, as we step into this next week, as we peer ahead, and we may not know everything that's going on, one thing we can be reassured of is we can trust you. When we've had a hard year and it didn't go the way that we thought it would go, we lean on you because we know that you are faithful and you are good. That you have plans that we may not understand, but you are working out your great purposes for our good and for your glory. Help us on both sides, in the middle of it, beyond it, as we look back. God, shower your goodness and your grace on your people as they navigate so many different things within their lives. We love you, God. We're thankful for you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So I'll stand together. Y'all, if you need a few moments to be able to come down here and pray, please, you're welcome to that. If you need that at your chair, do that. If you need a moment where you say, Paul, I've got questions about Jesus. I don't know him as my Savior. Please don't leave here without talking to me or another faithful believer in Christ that can talk with you about that. Or, listen, if you need a few moments for yourself at home because you're like, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to come down here. Thanks, Paul. I get it. Just don't allow these next few moments for you not to respond as God would lead you to do so. Let's sing together. Let's respond to the Lord.
faithfulness this morning. Amen. Well, we hope you've enjoyed your time here this morning. We hope that you've heard from the Lord as his word was proclaimed this morning through Paul's preaching. We do want to leave you with the top three things going on at Brainerd. So if you want to direct your attention up here, we do have Christmas at the crossing that's coming up. The weekend after Thanksgiving, we want to make sure, uh, or I'm sorry, two weekends after Thanksgiving, I uh, want to make sure that you know about that. Our vendors that are coming, they're church members from both here at Brainerd, North Georgia, as well as um, our Chattanooga campus, and so we want to make sure we go out and support them. All of the fees that they have paid to be a part of this are going straight to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, so um, it's a good way to support that as well. The second thing we want to point out is that our family our family Advent Guide, you can get actually by scanning this QR code right here. Um, there's a whole host of um, things on that guide from songs that they'll be singing back in Quest to materials that will help you um, as you go throughout Advent season with your children at home. So it really is uh, just a great resource that you can have uh, as you go throughout Advent. And then our last thing that we have um, is our life groups. And we just want to go ahead and highlight those. We're getting ready to come into a new year. We have several life groups that are getting ready to multiply as as our groups are getting bigger and there's excitement there and also sadness as we get ready to multiply too because we've been, we've been doing life with each other for, for quite a long time. But we want to make sure that you're aware that there are um, life groups available for you to get connected to. Thursday night. Don't listen to her. Thursday night. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that, yeah, you, we just want to make sure that you can get connected with those. So there's a QR code out there back by the coffee bar. Just take your phone, scan that, and it'll give you a list of all those different life groups from Sunday mornings to, I guess there's one on Tuesday night, but there's definitely some on Thursday night that you should check out. Uh, there's also Wednesday night. There, there's lots of nights. Just get, just scan it, and you can find it. Just whatever works in your schedule. It's a great way to get connected to the Brainerd North Georgia family and really just be able to, to do life with one another. Other than that, we want to leave you the same way we do each and every week. If you all will read this with me, our benediction, it says, May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that his way may be known on earth and his salvation among all nations. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next time.